Director of the Development Partner Institute, delighted to welcome you to this session, which is on the very interesting topic of turning sustainability into collective action. We have a very diverse panel, so I'll tell you who they are, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm thinking about with turning sustainability into collective action. And most of the session will be our speakers <coughs> talking from their perspective. So to my left, Abdullah Arwakis is the chair of the National Development Program here in Saudi Arabia. We have Peter Leon, who's a partner at Herbert Smith Freehills a law firm uh, that's an international law firm, and uh, he's going. So, Abdullah is going to speak about uh, national development and particularly youth, and Peter is going to speak about uh, legal frameworks. Then we have John Fennell from the International Copper Association, who's going to speak about uh, some fascinating work that the copper sector is doing uh, around zero emissions. Then we have Andrew Green, who's the CEO of the International Zinc Association. And Andrew is going to speak about collaboration, multi-commodity um, collaboration, very interesting. Then we have Xavier Miserez, who is head of sales at MKS Switzerland, which is a refiner and trader. And last but not least, we have Konrad von Schipensky, who is from Boston Consulting Group, an international, most of you will have heard of BCG, I'm sure, an international uh, firm that provides consulting services. And each of them will bring uh, a distinct perspective to our conversation about turning sustainability into collective action. So there are a few definitions of sustainability and one I really like is from Ban Ki-moon who was previously the Secretary General of the UN who said, sustainable development is the pathway to the future for us all. <laughs> or simply put, this is my um, taking his words of the pathway to the future for all, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children, which is a Native American proverb. What we're seeing, and we've heard a lot about this today already, is that business expectations have dramatically shifted in the last few years. Sustainability and ESG are now mainstream right across the value chain from investors to asset owners to automakers, computer makers, consumers of products, it's clear that sustainability and ESG are absolutely central themes for our sector. What does collective action mean? So the World Bank says that collective action is a collaborative and sustained process of cooperation between stakeholders. And as you'll hear today, there are many different views about what collective action means. And so these, this panel is about uniting these concepts of sustainability and collective action. I want to start by asking Abdullah what is it when it comes to sustainability and collective action? What is it that you're excited about? Shukran jazeelan. Bittakid, I'm in the right place, I'm excited and I'm excited. I'm excited uh, with the work of our uh, youth and uh, their role into actually confirming the vision and doing and working together with it. And they are all, the weapon is science and skills, and they are committed to the agenda of the vision. Abdullah, just, just a moment, please. Um, I, the English translation is not working yet. It's on two. It's on two. Okay. Uh, pardon me. Please keep going. 
So our youth are the people who are, who are and the sustainability is not a choice, is not a choice, but it's not part of a journey, it is still is the destination. In fact, our vision 2030 is by itself is a collective work to go to a sustainable economy and it is works with the economic development and to sustain environment as a priority and what has been achieved in this in this journey through the last five years is more than what we are expecting and it is hysterical and it, we never saw something like this and it is depth and size and also the sustainability always been a part of this transformation the overhaul and that is led by by his royal highness the crown prince and in all these and all of these projects in 2030 vision is both sustainability at the core of its plans and at its core priorities and although there is already other initiatives that based on sustainability such as the the Middle East, the Green Middle East, Saudi Green, and also the Neom City, the huge city, and that will have uh, a zero carbon uh, footprint to, uh, that work with uh, sustaining water and other than that, and all with non-carbon-based, and also to work with the green hydrogen. Mining in the vision of Saudi Arabia is is part of the Saudi vision and it is a strategic resource to be the third the third pillar of the Saudi development and it will at least a quarter of a trillion of the GDP of Saudi and to create more than 200,000 jobs and it will put the Saudi Arabia in the entrepreneurship in the mining and for example Saudi Arabia will be one of the biggest three producers for phosphate and, and one of the ten uh, producers of uh, aluminum and it will double its creation of gold and the copper for 10 times. And also it is going to be one of the 10 and the uh, 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 and agriculture products. It is, it is, and it's going to be sustainable. It is not going to be possible for any developer to, to, to get um, without getting the the, uh, the discovery to uh, closing mines. And this step is and for the social licensing. And while we refuse the option, the non-wise option between to preserve economy or to protect the environment, we believe strongly that the strategic sustainable uh, value is, comes from the developing policies and to engage youth and societies around the mining and to support the, the social creativity to create, to, to, to engage all the component of the society and to create a sustainable economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdullah. I, I hear a lot of... I hear a lot of passion around youth, um, so I'd like to just explore that in a in a little bit more detail. So, what do you see as being the critical two, the top two most critical elements to be able to advance 
youth. Uh, to just say that the youth are the basis of the, of the vision of Saudi Arabia 2030. And one of the two things that we have to point out at this sector that the uh, country is uh, heavily depending on in the future is to put uh, the youth at center of it and their contribution uh, takes in consideration two th main things. One is development, the, uh, the, the application in the mining and to participate in its programs. And as I, men I mentioned before, we are creating uh, 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 about, sorry, we are creating about 240 uh, million uh, billions uh, uh, of Saudi uh, rials, and the other thing is the youth that they will uh, participate uh, by investing, and that's their role uh, in return of the uh, support that giving from the government and from the private sector, and to empower them to put the best of what they can in their uh, continuous learning and to create the, an additional value for the uh, society and the economy. That's fantastic. Thank you, Abdullah. Sounds like a very exciting program. And we spoke uh, before the session about um, this is this is about empowering women and young women and men. And it's very exciting. So if I may turn to you, Peter. Uh, so Peter uh, is is an expert in developing good quality legal frameworks. So I'd like to, we'd like to hear from you what role could and should good quality legal frameworks play to promote collective actions that will enable sustainable development. Thank you very much, Wendy. Very, very good to be here this afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is a major question because if we actually think about ESG, it can mean different things to different people. You know, what does environmental and social governance mean? And I think the problem that everyone has at the moment is there is no universal or uniform standard. You have a plethora of standards which, with which mining companies you know, effectively have to comply, in addition to which you have uh, litigation by activist shareholders in the US and other countries, uh, even in developing countries like South Africa, where there's been a lot of environmental litigation. Uh, and you have a whole lot of laws coming down the track, particularly in the European Union. If you look at Germany, the Netherlands, the EU itself, um, Different countries are diff doing different things. So in, in, the, in, the, in Germany, with this new Corporate Due Diligence Act, um, companies which, are more than 3, 000, which have more than 3,000 employees are going to effectively have to have extensive human rights due diligence on all their suppliers from 2023. And that number will go down from 2024. So that will have a big impact on, say, a bauxite producer in Saudi Arabia because they will have to, com they will have to comply effectively with a German standard. Mm. So what you're seeing is developed countries imposing their standards on developing countries and that's a challenge obviously Saudi Arabia. Then the European Union you have through the parliament you've got this development of as you know as a directive around corporate due diligence which could potentially come into effect uh, in the next year or so. Uh, so you've got all these different standards which are essentially decentralized. What I think the, the challenge for this forum, uh, and this is a great opportunity, is how can we get to some single standard which mining jurisdictions or other jurisdictions who are in the extractives industry would meet and comply with? And I think that is the challenge, and that is what we need to look at um, developing, and maybe something that will come out of this, uh, this particular summit. Because, I mean, the thing is that there is, as I say, there's no universally coherent standard. Um, it's not clear what, you know, what role the law plays, because there's so many different standards you're having to comply with. Um, and, you know, I think that what would really be good 
is developing some sort of universal standard or some sort of framework which would guide what, uh, what, what the extractive industry has to comply with. And in the absence of that, Peter, yeah. the, the role of, of legal frameworks, could you expand a little bit more on that and also um, how, how you foresee updating legal frameworks yeah. to reflect the changing expectations of different yeah. stakeholders? Yeah, Wendy, it's a very good question again. I mean, to my mind, there, there are two things I want to mention. The one is the, I'm sure there are many Australians in the audience. The one, one is the experience in Western Australia, mm. which Rio Tinto had with the Jukun Gorge. We actually, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, there were lots of mistakes, but actually... You, you might just want to describe yeah, what yeah, happened in case yeah. people well, don't. What happened in the Jukun Gorge is that Rio Tinto had a permission from the Western Australian government to blow up some Aboriginal caves which, strictly speaking, they complied with the law, but the law was passed in 1972. Uh, they had nominally consulted with the community, but not very well or, or comprehensively. So Rio's argument was they had formally complied with the law, but in substance they hadn't, because they effectively broke their social licence. That had cost catastrophic consequences for the company in terms of its reputation as a major mining company, to be frank. It also cost the CEO <laughs> Jim, uh, and very senior executives of the company their respective jobs. So I think, and this all happened in the last year, so I think it is an example of, you know, basically how not to do things, but, but the point is that, strictly speaking, they had complied with the law. The problem is that the law is 40 years old, 50 years old. So. Bring it back to 2021, one of the great challenges I've had and opportunities I've had in my work as a lawyer is acting for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in developing the new mining investment law, working with the World Bank. And one of the clear instructions we got from the ministry and particularly from the minister uh, was that Saudi Arabia would follow international best practice and take from other jurisdictions what is the best thing to follow? So we looked at the best examples in Australia, Canada, and Botswana and Africa as models to follow from a mining development point of view. But more than that, there was a very, very strong focus on sustainability. Uh, what I mean by that is not just simply the environmental elements of sustainability, but what we did, which I think was very innovative, again, with the guidance of the ministry, was develop a very comprehensive community consultation system and a community grievance mechanism, which I think is pretty unique in the mining investment law world. So in a sense, what Saudi Arabia has now done with this new law, and we also draft the regulations and the guidelines, is to follow international best practice and be really up to date around what are the key areas in sustainability that stakeholders are looking at. So I actually think that, maybe this is your next question, but I actually think Saudi Arabia could lend this learning and this experience to other uh, mineral producers in this region uh, and really be a game changer around sustainability for the Middle East and Africa. I love that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Peter. I'm going to turn to John now. And as we've already heard today, Copper is a critical, critical mineral for the future. John, you're working on some really exciting zero emissions programs. Can you tell us about what you're doing and why that's important in the context of this discussion? Well, thanks, Wendy. And it's a, a joy to be in Saudi Arabia. So thank you for everybody who's invited us to come. Um, so, I represent the International Copper Association. Uh, the, the initiative that we've started with the Zero Emission Copper Mine of the Future, it's a mouthful, I'm sorry, uh, I'll just call it the Zero Mine and for the rest of the talk, is um, that in 2016 with the University of Sydney's Warren Centre, we did a technology roadmap on what the future demand supply picture looked like for copper. It's pretty obvi obvious today, looking back, um, but then it wasn't. 
And it was obvious that uh, the demand was growing for the obvious reasons of decarbonization, urbanization of India and China, and the move to renewable energy. What, what was really a problem was the shortage of supply that was pretty evident at that stage. And once you get in an industry like ours, the imbalance between the supply-demand area, the prices scoot up and you lose market share permanently. So that was a bad thing for us. Um, so we looked at what was causing the supply issue, apart from the GFC, uh, the post-GFC where people stopped investing. Um, it was that the grades were getting lower, the depth of the mines was going down to two kilometers. We had uh, all sorts of issues with water use. We had community backlash. But one of the things we hadn't counted on was that whilst people love copper, at that stage they had a pretty poor view of copper mining. And until we changed that, the times between uh, application for a new mine in, uh, and approval was going to stretch. And it was making it very hard to catch up with supply demand. So we had to change that view and we actually had to get the industry to do it together. So we, we developed the first zero emission copper mine of the future roadmap uh, in 2020, which has led on to, uh, will lead on to five deep dive research programs. But let me give you a vision of what the mine of the future looks like, because it's, it's a bit confronting today. But if you think about what the iPhone looked like today and go back 30 years, mm -hmm. you can sort of get the picture. And so the mine of the future is going to be relatively small in volume. It's going to be two kilometers deep. It's going to have grades of two to three percent. Um, it's going to be in water stressed areas. Uh, it's going to, there's not going to be a soul underground. It's going to be run by AI controlled drones who are going to scoot around digging up the most highly prospective ores from different areas. They're going to carry it back to an electrolytic processing plant two kilometers underground and then process it into 60 to 80 percent pure copper and lift it to the surface. The water savings, the energy savings, the health savings, security savings are amazing. On the surface or underground, it would be run by a myriad of alternative energy sources. We won't pick those, but it could be hydrogen or nuclear or re standard renewables. And the footprint on the surface will be minuscule. Now, that all sounds great, but to get to that position is incredibly difficult. It's a complex industry, and it's a dirty, big, rock-bearing, moving industry. So we have to drill down into silos of how do we move the material? How do we process the, the minerals into, into copper? How do we reduce water use? How do we discover the right stuff, and how do we get rid of the ventilation problems? And so to do that, we're doing deep-dive researches uh, in... 2020 on water, this year on materials movement, and we move forward. So that's, that's an overview, but we're giving, we're engaging with universities and CRCs and with mining company technologists and open innovation innovators across the globe. So that's really the overall plan of what we're doing. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, John. And one of the things that I know you're really excited about is a digital knowledge platform that you're uh, developing. Perhaps if you could share some, uh, show some of that with us. Okay, so uh, perhaps if, if I, digital knowledge platform, um, if anybody doesn't know what it, what it is, that's, that's fair enough. But if you look up Kumu, K-U-M-U, on your, on your mobile phones, it'll give you- Don't a, do it now. Fair, <laughs> fair idea. Basically, it's a, um, a complete disparate uh, knowledge platform, which, uh, will allow uh, mining executives, technologists, research organizations, universities, uh, mining company executives to drill down uh, under a, an emission theme down to a, 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 a one of the, the, the items that they're looking at, whether it's conveyancing or it's water recycling or it's desalination, and they'll be able to uh, look at all the technologies that exist now and that will exist in the future to get to zero emission. And we'll populate that particular platform with all the research that we're doing over the next three years and with the research out of Myra Global, which has done a copper technology roadmap. And as a mining executive wants to develop a new mine, um, he, uh, he can go and look at 
where the technology is today and with the Horizon 1, 2, and 3 technology developments over the next few years, he can predict and know how to advise his MET supplier on what technology he wants in certain areas of the mine that will get to zero emission. So it he, empowers he the mine. Sorry. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> my Thank apologies, mate. <laughs> will, they, yes, um, my apologies. And they will uh, be able to drive the company towards the technologies that sh will be available in eight or ten years, not the technologies that are <coughs> available now that are probably ten years old. So it's a complete change, and it means that people around the globe can add to it and, uh, and, and increase it and deal with some of the major technology challenges that we have to crack over the next uh, few years. And so that's the benefit of this knowledge platform. Thanks, that's fantastic. Thanks, John. And you're starting to see different elements of turning sustainability into collective action here because John's speaking about really highly technical um, digital capability and Abdullah spoke about youth and there's a tie there, isn't there, uh, about skilling our youth across the world so that they can, so that they'll be in a position to enable the kind of technologies yeah. that, that we're talking about. Absolutely. And for Peter, it's, a, it's about setting up the right legal frameworks yeah. and, and being able to update them that, in ways that will take account of the, this massive transition that we're seeing. So thanks for that. I'm going to turn to Andrew now. Andrew is really passionate about collaboration and has a great story to tell us about work that uh, is that he has underway with uh, a, a, across different commodities. So share that with us, please, Andrew. Thanks, Wendy, and it's an honor to be here with all of you today. Uh, I'd start by saying my, my group, the International Zinc Association, the way we bring value to our members to the zinc industry is really through the, the, the act of collaboration, uh, leveraging resources both within our organization and with the stakeholders, such as my associates here on the, on the, the panel. Uh, so the example that I would give you is uh, a couple years ago, LME, the Lenin Mills Exchange, uh, announced that they were going to require all the companies and brands that they are working with to demonstrate uh, and meet a standard for responsible sourcing. Now, they could have gone that alone. They could have developed that standard uh, without any input. Uh, but they recognized that the associations, uh, my association, the Copper Association, the Nickel Association, and so forth, that we had the knowledge, we had the information uh, that we could help and work together and benefit each other by uh, collaborating on this effort. And so it was a long-term effort. It was uh, the last couple years that this, this work uh, came about. But my group, along with the Copper Association, the Lead Association, Nickel Association, uh, another group called RMI, the Responsible Mining Initiative, uh, all worked together very closely with um, LME to develop this standard. And the, and the goal here was rather than each of the companies or each of the base metals, I should say, having their own separate standard with separate requirements, uh, we wanted to uh, collectively create a standard that worked across these different metals so that if you were a, uh, a, a multi-metal company, which most of the companies out there are nowadays, they could achieve and meet these standards for copper, for nickel, for zinc, and so forth. Uh, and so after this uh, long-term effort with a lot of work from my team and, and the other teams um, in collaborating on this effort, uh, a standard was developed. Uh, LME uh, looked at this, uh, assessed it with a third party, and agreed that it met what they needed uh, to meet the responsibility requirements. And so it was accepted uh, early last year, or I should say midway through last year. And what that did was it uh, reduced costs for the industry, it increased efficiencies across the industry, and it increased the awareness and the credibility for that standard. Fantastic, thank you. Andrew, can you tell us about the shift that you're seeing across mining from working in silos to working collaboratively? Sure, yeah, and I would 
probably go back to that same group of characters I was talking about before, my association, the Copper Association, and so forth. And I've been in the industry long enough to, to see where um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we were very much working separately in these silos, as Wendy referred to. And uh, the example I would give you with that is uh, life cycle assessment. Each one of the associations was, was doing a, a global life cycle assessment for their metal. Uh, this LCA would represent the backbone or basis for uh, everything having to do with sustainability assessments on these metals, so uh, carbon footprint and all that, that's required to develop uh, the information like that. And uh, the problem was that each of the groups was developing it on their own and you were comparing apples to oranges. You couldn't really do an assessment to see how this carbon footprint for this metal compared to this carbon footprint the specifiers really couldn't make uh, the, the proper decisions based on the information provided. And it created, I think, a very chaotic situation going forward. And that situation stayed there for a while until the associations and the companies recognized it was better for us to work together, uh, to develop these common uh, platforms that we could compare across these metals. Because it wasn't a, so much a competitive type situation, it was really trying to move sustainability forward by having a common language where you could compare the metals on an equal footing. And it, it's turned out to be a very successful initiative since then. Fantastic. What a great example of turning sustainability into collective action. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much, Andrew. I'm going to turn to Xavier now. And Xavier, you're dead passionate about provenance and traceability. So can you tell us about that and why it's important in the context of this conversation about turning sustainability into collective action? <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Wendy. Um, from what we've heard since this morning and, and right here in the panel, we understand that the origin of the commodities is very important, right? But in the gold industry, it's critical. Um, for years, we've been saying that gold is gold, and no matter where it comes from, it remains the same precious metal and has the same value. And the gold bar would differentiate from another gold bar just on the basis of the, pre the price, the premium. However, with the international standard, the development of the standard, and Andrew talked about it, but if we think of the OECD, if we think of the LBMA responsible gold guidance, uh, in particular in, in the gold industry, um, Gold is no longer, uh, the, the, how do you say, the gold is no longer just gold. Uh, we've been facing major risk, such as illegal mining, conflict financing, money laundering, um, human rights abuses. And on an ESG perspective, we see that the, the value of gold from a particular mine could have a different value from the gold from another mine on the basis of the ESG rating of that mining company. We've developed a technology uh, these past years. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. We've developed a technology these past years, um, which allows us to track and trace gold on a on an app. So by just scanning a gold bar, you can the app would identify the bar, confirm it's an authenticate, an original palm bar. And believe it or not, there are a lot of fake bars in the market, and it will disclose the exact origin of the gold that was used to produce that bar. So in this particular example, the gold comes from Saudi Arabia, 100% Saudi Arabia, from Madden Mines that we all know here. So that's an ounce of gold you have in your hand. Yes, sorry, it's an ounce of gold. <laughs> I'll be happy to, so this, the information is all registered on the blockchain. I'll be happy to show you how the app works um, after the presentation maybe. And by disclosing this information to my customer, this traceability to my customer, I can guarantee him a full transparency, a full traceability over the entire supply chain from the mine site throughout each of the actors, including the refiner, all the way to the finished product. And in, in the context of this conversation, why is uh, traceability <clears throat> so important? Well. By associating our name, our brand, to a particular mine site, and for our customer to select that particular source, we want to make sure that the, mine, the mining company goes the extra mile when it comes to ESG, sustainability. Uh, the G would be the first one to think of, obviously, because we want to make sure, as Peter mentioned before, 
it extract legally, you know, it's exported legally, it's paying its taxes properly. But on an environmental perspective, we want to make sure the mine is not using mercury, there's no spillage of chemicals, that they have maybe a reforestation plan, that um, they have uh, protection, uh, measures to protection the biodiversity that was mentioned uh, this morning in the panel, for instance. On the social aspect, uh, we want to make sure there's no child labor, that um, we want to know how the mining company is supporting the community, build infrastructure, provide education, training to this community that they hire in the mine. By disclosing <clears throat> the, the full traceability of that supply chain, that will oblige the mining company to guarantee that they have put in place the best possible mining practices. And this also, this is not only the mining company, but it's all the actors of the chain, again, including the refiner. And one of the consequences would actually be beneficial to the mining company because they will be able to sell their production at a higher price thanks to these ESG efforts, higher than the LBMA price. And on top of that, and that's where the real advantage is for them, being a listed company for most of them, their share price will increase dramatically because any investor today in the world would look at an ESG rating of a company before he would put a penny in it. And that is where the collective action takes on its full meaning. And I, I truly believe that, well, obviously traceability is very essential. And I'm proud to say that MKS has developed this provenance solution that would allow our customer to ensure to select the source of its choice on the basis of his own criteria and ensure a full segregation of the, the process throughout the entire chain and the refining process and guarantee this 100% traceability. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Xavier. You've kind of answered this, but I'm just going to ask you uh, one quick addition. So you're, you're very close to your customers, to the buyers of your products. What are they telling you is critically important for, in terms of sustainability? One thing. One thing. <laughs> um, sustainable gold uh, was very niche. Um, it was mostly driven by small initiative on artisanal mining. And the, the, the um, scalability of it was very challenging. Because of that, a lot of jewelers were thinking of the big brands, the big name, the Swiss watchmakers, um, the electronic companies from the Silicon Valley, for instance. They moved away from mine material, and they decided to source exclusively from recycled material to fulfill their sustainability criteria and to mitigate, obviously, their, their reputation risk. It was the easy solution, let's say. And thanks to that solution that I just described, we can, the companies are willing to revise their sourcing strategy and eventually shift to go back to accept to buy mine material, mine, uh, yeah, mine gold. And it answers, it, it, it goes, it will answer their sustainability demand and it will go beyond by providing them with a positive ESG impact, I would say. So on the, thanks to the traceability, we would help them mitigate this reputation risk that I mentioned. And on the ESG perspective, the fact that they're working with sustainable and responsible actor, it will allow them to generate an ESG, like a positive impact throughout their, cha their chain. And then I think an important example, <coughs> sorry, an important example that, that was discussed already quite a bit is this trend of having zero emission or reducing emission or offsetting emissions. And a lot of these big brands they they want to show low figures, obviously, on their scope three, on their on their uh, uh, commitment towards the Paris Agreement. But the reality is, these mining companies, the reduction potential is so much greater on the mine material than it is on the recycle. So this is a great reason for these jewelers, big brand, to switch back to mine material. And lately, I've been to um, a mine site in Latin America with one of the big uh, the Swiss watch brand. That, were, that used to buy recycled. And it's interesting, we talked to the management, we looked at their uh, different ESG projects, and the brand decided not only to switch back, but to revise their marketing strategy and advertise it to the point that they're gonna create a special watch collection in which the gold that will be in this watch will come exclusively from that particular mine site. 
because they understand that the real benefit here to disclose all of this effort to their customers, right? So <clears throat> maybe a last word is to mention here is until recently, mainly because of margins, but also because of reputation risk, it was mostly jewelers that would, that would be willing to pay a few extra dollars maybe to get that traceability. But today, the banks, the, the funds, the financial sector, they're not only they're ready to go that step and pay a few extra dollars to get that traceability, but the market requires it. As I mentioned, most of the bank would have an ESG committee today, and this ESG committee would have to approve any investment the bank would do. And among these investments, there's the gold acquisition, the gold purchases. So it's, it's essential for them to make sure that it can be approved by the ESG. And the bank's customers are not only willing and, and asking for this traceability, but they're, they're accepting to pay for it today. I think it's, it's very important. Yeah, it's a great, great comment. So what we're starting to see here is the closing of the loop with the customer and their yeah. expectations. Thank you very much for that, Xavier. Thank you. And to Conrad now, da last but definitely not least, what are you excited about, Conrad? What I'm excited about is the, is the topic collective action for sustainability. The companies, mining companies, but also companies in other industries are realizing that they just cannot go alone, and particularly in the mining industry, that uh, realization is now, I think, firmly established. I take a, take a normal bulk mining company, iron ore, copper, or coal, 90% of their uh, emissions profile is scope three, right? Downstream largely in the processing and usage of the materials. But even for a gold mining company, it is more than one third of their total emission scope two. In this case, it's more upstream energy supplies and services. So collective action, firmly needed. What it's, the second uh, thing that excites me is that when we recently looked at about 50 sustainability in alliances across industries, a good quarter of them actually was founded in the last few years, last five years, and a good quarter of them are actually making real impact at the root cause at scale. And that includes two mining alliances, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Association and the Responsible Minerals Initiative. But the third thing that excites me is now there are almost three quarters of these sustainability alliances that do not yet make an impact at scale. So there's an enormous improvement potential to make these sustainability alliances more impactful, more in, uh, effective, and do it faster. Because when you also look at the quarter of them that are already making an impact, the median time frame it has taken them to get to this level is about seven years. So clearly, we need the sustainability alliances to perform better, faster. Thank you. And how can we do that? So that's the, the fourth uh, topic, if you want, that excites me. When we analyze these 50 sustainability alliances across industries, um, and we classified them according to the impact they made and the, and the impact potential and so on. What became very obvious that there were about 10, what we termed the 10 golden rules, that will be in article forthcoming, um, about what distinguishes the impactful ones from the less impactful ones. And let me just give you three examples. First, it matters who you partner with. Right? and you are about four times more likely to make an impact as an alliance if you have a broad participation along the value chain. Right? The initi uh, Initiative for Responsible Mining Insurance is a great example. They bring together mining companies, NGOs, communities, customers, including at their, at their board with uh, influence on, on governance. Right? Um, when you look at the very closely related to the mining industry, the logistics industry, the Merck McKilly Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping brings together shipping companies, fuel companies, engine companies, banks, 
uh, to decarbonize the shipping industry. You need the same approach to decarbonize, say, the steel industry. Right? So value chain representation important. Secondly, what you do in the alliance, and that is a theme I think, Andrew, that you mentioned already, is transparency about data. Right? Cast your mind back to the early 90s when there were no accepted standards about reporting safety in the mining industry. Right? Since we all settled on TRIF and TRI and lost time injuries and OSHA definitions, we have data transparency, which then enables actually competition, allocation of capital, allocation of resources and talent, and we've seen enormous progress. So da creating data transparency, not just in the industry, but also externally to partners, to investors, is crucial. And you're about three times more likely to make an impact as a sustainability alliance if part of your agenda is creating data transparency. And thirdly, it's about coming, having a very clear impact strategy. So how do you mobilize as an alliance? You need to have a very clear purpose as an alliance and know how you as an alliance and the collective of the participants make an impact. And coming back to that impact strategy, reporting on it, publishing data, holding yourself to account, um, again, makes you about three times more likely to have an impact than if you don't do that. So from looking at this, population of sustainability alliances in the mining industry and beyond, we have a really good understanding of what you need to do to make a real impact. And that gets me really excited. Mm. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Conrad. I think we're running down to the clock um, at the moment. So um, what I'm going to ask each of the participants is, what would your call to action be? So very, very quickly, what would your call to action be, Abdullah? It is to, to create the value and to enrich the value through the engagement of the social society and the other sectors that is going to enrich our... Uh, and this is one of the steps, the very important steps, and it was on the national program. This program, it works with the mining with more than 20 years and one of the examples uh, that uh, the cheerful uh, examples I saw in this forum some of the leaderships who participated to enormous the value through engaging the society and at the same time also the created initiatives to enhance the engagement of the society with the sustainability and also two examples uh, live examples one of which is related to the, uh, His Excellency Khaled al Mudafir, the Vice Minister of the for Mining at the Ministry. He participated uh, uh, at the program in the Oxford uh, and advanced uh, advanced leadership at Oxford before 13 years ago. And also the other example, the CEO of uh, Taadin or Mining. Uh, mining company, Ma'adin, about 11 years ago, he put out the same program. These kind of uh, uh, programs and engagement and within uh, and the other different sectors who are related to develop such uh, uh, initiatives or future initiatives that are valuable and shows that uh, could close gaps. Unfortunately, it is very deep uh, gap, but however, we can uh, s close these gaps that needed by the societies around the uh, mines and also uh, especially the places who have less uh, 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 development and through this kind of cooperation we can bridge uh, the gaps and can uh, reach some important goals. Thank you. Thank you very much for your perspective, Abdullah. The, uh, the, I love that call to action the importance of engagement, the critical importance of engagement, and also the critical importance of education to build, to bridge gaps. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, what's your call to action? 
Well, I think, uh, Wendy, that my call to action is for other countries to follow what Saudi Arabia has done, and to, on, especially on the social, so, social impact study side. And that really is, I touched on it earlier on, but just to give a little bit more flavor about that, it not just involves community consultation, the community grievance system, but involves local content requirements so that the, you know, the local communities are able to provide goods and services to a mine. I think that's very progressive. Mining companies have to contribute 1% of their revenue to a social development fund. I think that's another uh, step forward. Um, and there's now uh, a, a system in place where companies, through an appointed executive, have to manage the whole community performance process. So it's, you know, I, I think it's a game changer for the mining industry and it should really be an example to the region uh, as to how to embrace good practice in a sust socially sustainable manner. Fantastic. So good legal frameworks yeah. across the region uh, in, that include the social aspect. Wonderful very critical. call to action as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. John. Um, Wendy. It's really interesting sitting here. So we got you know strategy and legal frameworks, and we got standards, and we got traceability, and then we got process, which I was I really love what what you said, Conrad. I think it brings a certain you know prof huge professionalism with how we go about making this change. The cold and and you know the vision that we're putting putting forward, the the the, the gap you know that e people want to make this change, but it's really hard. Mm. You know, it's complex, it's yeah. very expensive, and it's gonna take 30 years to do it. So that commitment is, you know, it's easy to have, say, yes, let's do it. Mm. But as his, her, his Highness said this morning, this is, a, this is a tough road we're on, and anybody thinks that you can crack millions of tons of rocks and not, not cause a bit of damage is, is foolhardy. So my call to action is that we, we should do more of this, this collaboration between multi-skills and multi-groups, because you won't get it within one core, you'll get it as this collaboration. So my call to action is just continue to bring groups like this together to work and set the framework and the, and the drive to do it. That's, uh, I couldn't agree more, and I think this kind of forum is so valuable mm -hmm. in this region and, to, and very exciting. And there are other formats as well, aren't there, that um, need to come together to, to, uh, to take a collaborative approach. Thank you. Andrew. I, I would say looking at uh, how you bring about change quickly in an area, market drives the change, market drives the economy. Uh, and the standard approaches for, for doing the, the market approach would be either a, a pull strategy where you have the consumers driving what's happening or a push strategy uh, where you have government uh, intervention and so forth. And I think Saudi Arabia has a great opportunity here um, mm. to take this action of setting the standards, putting out specifications and standards for all the construction that's going on. I was able to visit uh, some of the sections here in Riyadh, uh, the financial district and so forth, saw all the buildings going up. And if the government could put in the standards and specifications requiring responsible materials, uh, sustainable materials being used in that construction, that will help drive the marketplace and it will go upstream and downstream from that, uh, helping to ensure sustainability across those different activities. It's Thank another you. example, isn't it, of pulling the, the value chain of mining together and working together in collaborative ways. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Xavier. Uh, <clears throat> if there's one thing I'd like you to remember out of this conversation of what I've said before is to investors, to bankers, bullion traders, jewelers in Saudi Arabia, in the region, support and promote the LBMA good delivery products only. These are the only products that will give you the assurance that the gold you're getting was sourced in a responsible and in a sustainable manner. And if you want to go one step beyond, then we have our provenance gold whereby you could select your source and decide to go 100% Saudi gold refined in Switzerland. 
<laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Conrad. My call to action is building on what, what John and the members of this distinguished panel said is collective action, engage in collective action, but also realize how difficult it is. Right? The, so sta typically, Sustainability Alliance has 50 members. 80% of joint ventures that companies typically engage in are two partner joint ventures. So you have more partners. 95% of sustainability alliances are global versus about half of typical alliances. Right? The goals are much more complex. You have sustainability with all its facets and components versus just financial goals. But they are mandatory. You cannot go alone. So engage in collective action and realize how difficult it is get it right, face the, face the facts. Mm. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you, our audience, for your very keen ears. And I would like to thank our panel here. So you've heard a development perspective, you've heard a legal frameworks perspective, you've heard two very different perspectives from different uh, uh, commodity associations, but a, a strong linkage between them, I would say. Uh, you've heard the perspective on provenance and traceability, and you've heard a fantastic perspective also on collaborative action and a call to action. I think that all of us can take something away from. I have really enjoyed getting to know my panel and hearing about what they're passionate about. And I, I think that passion came through. So if you could join me in thanking our wonderful panel of speakers. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our wonderful audience as well. Thank you, Wendy, thank you. for the moderation yeah. of the panel. Thank you, thank you. Wendy, thank you, Wendy. Thank wonderfully you, Wendy. moderated. <coughs> thank you. Thank you.